Hello and welcome to The Outtakes, the official podcast of National Student Pride. Thank you for joining us as we go behind the scenes with a series of inspiring young queer people who are making a real difference working both within and outside the community to better the lives of LGBTQ plus people everywhere. Before we begin, I would like to thank EY and Clifford Chance for being the proud sponsors of National Student Pride. Without further ado, um, joining us is Tate Smith. Tate is an award-winning activist and speaker passionate about improving trans male visibility, educating others and debunking common myths surrounding trans people. Hi Tate, how are you? Welcome to the podcast. Hi Ben, I'm very well, thanks. How are you doing? Thank you so much for joining. I know it's a late Friday evening, but um, you're really doing the God's work joining us today. Very excited. (laughs) This has been a long time coming. No, it has. It definitely has, especially from my Clifford Chance days and attending the festival. It's been, yeah, a couple of years in the making. So thanks for having me. For any of our listeners who may not know who you are or any of your achievements, could you please tell us about yourself and all the amazing what you do? Sure. So my name's Tate Smith. My pronouns are he, him, and I'm an out and proud transgender man. So I'm best known for my activism and my speaking, but I primarily work as a legal secretary, previously of which was at Clifford Chance, one of your sponsors. Um, So like you said in the intro, I specialise in talking about the trans male lived experience and giving more visibility to trans men whilst touching on some taboos like toxic masculinity, male privilege and the effects of testosterone, both physical and mental. It's really, really important to me to tackle those taboos and debunk those common myths and just educate people about what it's like to actually live as trans and give some visibility to trans men who often go underrepresented within the media. So I've been really lucky to go into these corporates and speak about this and advise on policy. Um, And that's led me to a recent Community Role Model Award nomination by Pink News, which I was very, very lucky to receive. Very impressive. Cool. Yeah. LinkedIn put me in their top voices list in uh, Pride Month last year. And obviously my biggest achievement today is probably Attitude Magazine naming me a trailblazer, which is a lot to live up to, but uh, I seem to be doing well so far. That's a good thing to put in your LinkedIn profile. No, definitely. (laughs) If there was one. Tate, what I do want to highlight is some of your career goals and some of the things you've achieved in your career as well. You previously worked at the law firm Clifford Chance as a legal secretary and now are preparing to move to Gibson and Dunn. What inspired you to enter the legal sector and what challenges have you faced? So I accidentally fell into becoming a legal secretary and I did really, really well in my GCSEs, but I failed A-levels twice and I had a year left to play with before I turned 19 and have to pay for college. And I was flicking through the college brochure. I remember it vividly. And there was obviously plumbing and health and beauty and all the other vocational courses, but none of them really fit me. And uh, I thought, well, I'm interested in law. I can type really fast and I've got a good knack for documents. So why not do this for a year, get straight into working in law and see where it takes me. And I started the course in September, supposed to finish in May, and I was in full time employment by March. So it really worked out for me. So luckily, I started working in a legal admin job. Um, I went to BDO and I did an anti-money laundering role, which was obviously very different, but just to add more strings to my bow. Uh, And then I ended up at Clifford Chance, which I spent most of my career coming in as a junior legal secretary. And then that's where I started developing as an activist and a speaker, delivering lunch and learns, you know, hour long sessions where I educate people about what it's like to be trans with a QA and a session included. And then I did a project management secondment whilst I was there. And afterwards, I thought, why not go into a smaller law firm? So then I joined Memory Crystal, which is a much more smaller law firm compared to Clifford Chance over in Fleet Street. And now, like you say, I'm preparing to move over to Gibson Dunn, which is an American law firm still in the city of London and as a legal secretary. Um, So I've been working, you know, nine to five every day as a legal secretary and then doing all my speaking and my activism kind of ad hoc. And what's fascinating about you for me anyway is that you seem to have crafted your own sort of 
career pathway to getting where mm. you want to be? Yeah. No, that's been exactly the case for me, especially coming from a poor working class background. I didn't really have any strong role models to look up to. And law for me was the be and end all. It was kind of the creme de la creme of careers and pathways. And when you're doing your A-levels, it's so strictly uni. And obviously there was a moment of doubt after I failed my A-levels and I thought, actually, maybe I'm not clever enough to go to uni. God, what am I going to do now if I can't do a degree? And I'm now a really, really strong advocate for apprenticeships and vocational courses because it's really, really important to equip yourself with those tools within a year or less than if you think about the time you have for exams and the time you're spent in the classroom. And then you go straight into work. And I've been able to work my way up and get good you know, five years under my belt as a legal secretary. And now I'm off to a big American firm. I mean, I'm so far away from what I perceived, what my career would look like. And I've gone from, you know, struggling and being broke whilst attending college and thinking, oh my God, you know, I can't go to uni. That's it. I've got no career prospects to now thriving, not only in my transition, but in my career as well. That's so cool. So you mentioned you're from sort of a more of a lower income working class family. Where are you from originally? I'm from Essex. So oh, I, Essex. Up, I should have caught that yeah. the accent. <laughs> <laughs> the accent comes in and out. I live in South East London now, so I'm kind of getting the twang of both. But yeah, I, I grew up in a low income family, a single parent family. I received free school meals at school. Um, I certainly wasn't rich and I went to school uh, in Loughton and Brentwood as well. And during that time was when the only way Essex came onto the scene. So there was a lot of materialism and, it, you know, your your own worth was based on what you wore and what bag you had. And uh, that certainly wasn't me. And there was um, some sort of sort of careers that were stuck to that as well. I mean, ironically enough, a lot of women in Essex do go on to become legal secretaries. So I found myself kind of the token male legal secretary in the sense, and a lot of the men go into sales or recruitment, and there's a lot of business and entrepreneurs, and a lot of people typically don't go to uni. Uh, that's what I found, and that was sort of a rarity. But when I, especially when I was in school, that was definitely being pushed down my throat i'm from coventry which is sort of right in the middle of the country next to birmingham yeah. there's not really much going on there i think i've had somewhat of a similar experience in that sense that i think for queer people when they're not in a big city with a lot of opportunities and that you don't see a lot of queer people around you it's sort of a very heteronormative environment sometimes almost your academic achievements are almost your golden ticket out of that life. Yeah. And I think for a lot of people, it puts a lot of queer people anyway, it puts a lot of pressure on you to almost win that golden ticket. Like you need to be Charlie and you need to get into that chocolate factory ASAP so you can start living more authentically and open. No, no, I completely agree. And that was definitely the way it was for me because I just didn't fit in in Essex. I knew that London was always my calling even before I realised that I was trans. And then obviously when I did realise I was trans around the tender age of 16, I thought exactly that, this is my ticket out of here. I really need to move into London, kickstart my career and, and make something of myself, but most importantly, fund my own transition as well. So the two have kind of gone hand in hand with each other. So you've done all this amazing work alongside Clifford Chance, advocating for top surgery to be covered under the firm's private medical insurance. What were the avenues you you explored when trying to achieve this? And what were the processes involved? Like, can you sort of um, sort of go into a bit of that for us? Yeah, sure. So to give you a bit of context, I started medically transitioning in April 2019. And I joined the firm in July. So I had a really bad experience coming out in workplaces before then. So I was prepared to go stealth, to go back into the closet and just see how far I would get. And after a couple of months and just being so comfortable in the firm, it became very, very apparent that me being stealth wasn't necessary because I was very, very welcome there. And I already knew about their history with pro bono cases uh, and the LGBT network Arcus. So that gave me the comfortability to come out. 
And then I helped with draft redrafting their trans policy. But what I noticed was that they offered health care for trans people under their private medical insurance and bottom surgery, but they didn't cover top surgery, so the procedure to masculinize and flatten your chest. And obviously, that is the first thing you're going to see when I enter a workplace you know, and I was having to wear binders to flatten my chest for up to eight to 10 hours a day. So that was putting a lot of pressure on my chest and my breathing and my rib cage. And I was also having to dress carefully, you know, no white shirts because people would see through it, you know, jumpers over the top in the summer, completely, you know, sweaty. And when I spoke to somebody within the firm who put me in touch with the private medical insurance provider, they said, well, having top surgery is like having a boob job, isn't it? It's, it's cosmetic. And I said, well, it's not because you're not amplifying something. You're taking something away and you're reconstructing it because it's not like a double mastectomy that perhaps cancer patients may have. You're not just getting rid of the breast tissue. You are reconstructing it. You're doing the nipple graft. You're doing the pecs. You're making it look typically masculine. And I really had to fight to get this policy changed. But I was really, really lucky that their diversity and inclusion team, HR and benefits were all championing me and behind me. And I'm so, so grateful to Clifford Chance because I nearly went and took out a loan and went private, which would have cost me £9,000. Top surgery typically costs between seven to £9,000. Such extortionate costs that some trans men actually end up going to Turkey or Poland and recovering in an Airbnb on their own. So that was definitely not the route that I wanted to take. And luckily for me, the private medical health insurance provider saw sense and changed the policy a month before I planned to have surgery which was in August 2020. So that was right after we were in the midst of lockdown, but hospitals started performing surgeries again. Um, so I not only saved myself that horrible cost, which would have meant that I've spent around 11,000 just on my private medical transition, taken to the cost of hormones and appointments, but it's meant that future trans people coming into the firm have access to that surgery too. And what's happened is I did a lovely speech about it at Trans in the City where Clifford Chance and Deutsche Bank and EY and all of these great corporates come together to celebrate trans people. And a big organization um, that I, whose name I have to keep private attended that, saw that speech and implemented that exact same policy and when I was at the Pink News Awards in October, one of their employees came up to me and said, after we've implemented that policy, six trans people have come out within our firm and now have access to that same level of healthcare and that surgery. So it's inspired other people. And I'm sure I've not heard of maybe similar cases but I'm a real advocate for it. And when I speak to corporates, even when I have a briefing call before planning to do a lunch and learn with them, I say, what policy do you have? And do you cover both top and bottom surgery? Because it's so important to give that same level of healthcare and access and benefits to your trans employees as, as well as the rest of your employees. You made so many interesting points that I actually want to dive into a bit more detail. For example, how do you almost learn these sort of techniques to get through your day-to-day -day life living as a trans man? So for me, it was a lot of Googling and finding out what to you know flatten my chest with. So I think every trans man starts off with cutting up sports bras, but for some people with larger chests, as I certainly have, you have to go for binders. So the go-to binder is always the GC2B for trans masculine and non-binary and gender variant people. And that really works well with flattening your chest. And some people go to underworks as well. Um, so it was a lot of trial and error and trying to find the right fit. But as you can imagine, these come with a cost. So 
a lot of them come from American stores. So you're not only paying around like £30 to get the binder, which is expensive in itself, but then you're paying for the shipping, which in some cases can be like £80 and you get a lovely letter from Royal Mail through your door telling you you've got to pay it before you even get the binder. Um, and then you need different colours as well to go under your shirt because you're constantly worrying about being caught, about not passing well. I remember when I worked at Clifford Chance, I think somebody said, oh, why is that boy wearing a, a crop top underneath his shirt? Because they didn't know what a binder was. Um, so there was a lot of that, oh my God, am I not going to be seen as a real boy? You know, it really, really impacts on your mental state and your well-being. And it means you can't bring your full self to work. Yeah. You know, I'm not comfortably in my chair when I'm walking past meeting rooms I'm looking at my reflection I'm constantly going into the bathroom to adjust my binder you know I'm sweating I'm constricting myself it's hard to breathe it's also hard to speak from my chest and make my voice sound deeper because I have this binder on so this is all going on whilst I'm trying to work and by having that policy in place not only alleviates that pressure physically and metaphorically, but it cuts down the waiting times as well that you would typically have to access that top surgery. Because as you may or may not know, it's actually around six, five to six years to even get on hormones now on the NHS. And then you have to be on hormones for at least six months to a year to access surgery. So you're waiting years and years for top surgery. I got mine a year after I was on testosterone. So it cuts it down by way more than half just by implementing a simple policy. I guess it's that thing of like, I want to transition, but I need money to do it. Um, yeah. So I need a good job, but I, yeah. I can't transi transition because then I might not get a good job. So it's that whole like that battle. So was it a case of, you almost feel like you felt in a more comfortable environment to do that and that sort of then snowballed into where you are now yeah similar so when I first started my career I was working whilst presenting female in a legal admin job and I did that for around six months because I wanted to progress elsewhere and then I went to another organization and during this time um, I was kicked out of home for reasons beside my trans identity. And that kind of acted as the catalyst for me wanting to fund my private medical transition. Because for a bit of context, I had originally come out at 16, but I had to go back into the closet for two years. So during those two years, I did my A-levels, I failed them, I did my legal secretary course, and then I started working. So I lived 19 years to the fullest or trying to present in female. And I thought enough is enough. And actually when I joined this new place and I saw the onboarding form and it said preferred name, I thought I'm going to put Tate and I'm going to put he, him. I'm just going to go for it. This is, this is my life now. You know, I don't want to live the rest of my life. I don't want to, to die as a woman. And I then started transitioning whilst I was at this workplace. And obviously that was sort of the reason why I left the previous one, because I needed to have that extra disposable income to afford, unfortunately, the £350 in private medical appointments. And I had three of those just to get onto testosterone and then follow ups in between. And then I started off on private prescriptions and then did shared care with the NHS. So paying nine pound monthly for my hormones. So all in all to get onto testosterone, I had to pay a thousand pounds. And that was obviously semi okay for me having a job. But you know, I wasn't on a massive extortionate salary. I think I went from 20 to 22,000. So that was eating a big chunk of my disposable income. And I was living off of pasta and peanuts. I was nicking my housemates' food. Like I was literally starving just to get onto hormones. So I had to really, really struggle. And I see a lot of trans people who do fundraisers 
and fundraising parties and GoFundMes or ask for money at birthdays or Christmas or try and work all these odd jobs or take on another job at the weekend just to afford these appointments because the NHS waiting times are five to six years. I first got referred in October 2018. I still haven't been seen. I haven't received the letter. I haven't been acknowledged. Wild. And I transitioned during this time and had my top surgery. So by the time they see me, whenever it is in a couple of years, I will just be there just to have blood tests. It's going to serve no use to me. So it's really, really crazy the things that go into transitions that a lot of people really don't think about. I didn't have the language to articulate my transness growing up. I didn't even know what gay or lesbian was. So I stumbled across an FTM, female to male transgender person on YouTube, documenting their transition. And I was in a study break at college and it just clicked. I thought that that is what I've been looking for. And that is exactly the terminology I needed because that was 2015. So we had a big boom in media representation of LGBT people. We had Miley Cyrus coming out as gender fluid and pansexual. We had Laverne Cox, the trans woman in Orange is the New Black. Obviously, Caitlyn Jenner had her big vanity fair coming out. There was a lot more conversations being had. So a lot more of these terms were making their way into my lexicon. So by this point, I really realized something so big about myself. And I thought, this is the label that I need. And I didn't have that big mum, dad sitting on the sofa. I was too scared to do that. So I actually wrote on a post-it note to my dad, I want to be a boy, handed it to him and ran out of the room. And when I came back, he said, not under my roof, mate. And then I struggled for the next couple of months to try and socially transition. So telling everybody I was Tay, pronouns he, him, trying to wear men's clothes and just try and live and pass as male. But, you know, I, I had no support from my family. So I had to go back into the closet and then ended up transitioning two years later. So it's definitely not a fairy tale. I mean, a lot of gay people or from what I've heard, a lot of times they get told, oh, we knew anyway. And then you go, well, why didn't you support me when you thought that I was struggling? And for trans people, we have a completely different experience. No one, well, I rarely hear of supportive parents. If they might, they might come round to it later or might need some time, and that's perfectly valid. But I have never heard of an example where parents of a trans kid or adult have said yeah that's fine we're we're totally on board with that and if there are examples I applaud you and I'm really really happy for you but that's not what I've heard and really really scary to navigate so Tate we are unfortunately coming to the end of the episode but um, I will say this has been such an enlightening and enriching conversation and I'm really excited for our listeners to um, to be a part of that. So I guess my final question is, we're currently in a very challenging political climate for trans people, with the Conservative government placing trans people in the very centre of a culture war. I know we sort of briefly touched upon that earlier. And this is now having like real life consequences on the lives of trans people. For example, the government's recent decision to block Scotland's gender recognition reform bill. How do you think the LGBTQ plus community can come together to fight this? And are you hopeful for the future moving forward? That's a great question. And first and foremost, we really do need other people in the community standing up for trans people, because as we know, there's no LGBT without the T. And I know that there's been some internalized transphobia within the community that I've unfortunately heard of to the point where people actually think that T should be separate Mm. to you know the rest of the acronym but we really do need people's allyship and solidarity as well and that comes in and out of the community so we really need to be more conscious about what we're sharing online and not just simply resharing or reposting something although it's powerful why are you sharing this why is this so important what impact is this going to have on on trans people and champion us and give us that platform Um, I've just been really fortunate that I've had a quote featuring an article that my G work, the inclusive job board, um, have written about the protests that happened outside Downing Street. That is one simple way 
for people to hear directly from a trans person about what the protest was for and what it was like to be there rather than all of these headlines which I know are going to come out of it which are going to paint us in a negative mm -hmm. light um, but we really need people's support and love. We need our community rallying around us because we can't do this alone. That's why it's so amazing we've got people like you in your own way, leading the way and bringing the fight to where you see it needs to be brought to. Then having this interview with you as well, I, I can leave feeling like you are a very impressive person. <laughs> thank you you've done some amazing things i really wish the best luck to you in the future thank you so much tay have a great evening and i can't wait to see what you do in the future thank you have a lovely evening and thanks for having me